Most medical students and non-specialist doctors are unconfident about their fundoscopy skills. Indeed, their difficulty with fundoscopy overshadows their entire confidence with approaching any patient with eye diseases. However, in the course of this series of videos, we have now come to establish that you do not need to perform fundoscopy to take an accurate history, test the visual acuity, or to examine all the structures of the eye in front of the retina. However, the time has now come to examine the optic disc and retina, and I'm going to talk you through it in a series of steps which I hope will enable you to successfully visualize the retinal structures. Fundoscopy requires the use of a, an ophthalmoscope, but that ophthalmoscope needs to be used in a dark room, which is sometimes a tall order in many hospitals. You need to use a modern, fully charged ophthalmoscope, which is sometimes hard to find on busy wards. I would strongly recommend, if at all possible, that you instill tropicamide eye drops into both eyes of the patient you wish to perform fundoscopy on, having previously established that they do not have a shallow anterior chamber, because it makes fundoscopy much easier. You need to sit the patient comfortably uh, with looking into the distance. You need to uh, situate yourself at the patient's eye level. If you are standing up, it's tempting to come from on top, but then if you do so, you will not be level with the patient's optic nerve and will find a featureless part of the retina, if indeed you can see the retina at all. You need to triangulate not only your horizontal position, but also your lateral position relative to the patient. And here, you need to make sure that you are coming in at an angle of between 20 and 40 degrees to the side of your patient, so as to come straight down onto the patient's optic nerve. Having set yourself up in that position, you should put your front foot level with the patient's thigh and your back foot somewhere comfortable where you are nicely balanced to begin fundoscopy. One of the major causes of failure of fundoscopy is the fact that the patient wants to close their eye in response to the bright light. I would suggest that first you establish contact with the patient by placing your hand on their forehead. You should then roll your thumb over the eyebrow and then onto the eyelashes at the margin of the upper eyelid to ensure that the patient cannot blink. When you and the patient are in the correct position, you then need to turn on your ophthalmoscope and hold it hard up against your eye. If you're examining the patient's right eye, hold the ophthalmoscope up against your right eye. You then need to envisage a cone of light going from your ophthalmoscope to the patient's eye. You should already have a red reflex and this beam of light is your flight path down which you must move your head by using most of the muscles of your body to move towards the patient. Here is that flight path from a different angle and you can realize how easy it is to veer off that flight path and lose all sight of the retina. Seen from on top, you can see that your flight path needs to take you down a narrow cone straight onto the patient's eye and not veer off to any other part of the head. So your movement in effect is a bit like a lunge from arm's length from the patient right up to very close to the patient. The closer you are to the patient, the more of the retina you will see at once. So you need to be as close as is decent to the patient. My suggestion is that actually you hold your ophthalmoscope and your nose hard up against your thumb knuckle, such that you're as close as possible to the patient. And here is that movement in action, coming as close to the patient as possible by touching the knuckle of your left thumb with your nose and ophthalmoscope. 
then you are able, once you're looking at the optic nerve, to get the patient to look up, such that you can see the superior retina, and down to visualize the inferior retina, left to see the nasal, and right to see the temporal retina. If you have found you have successfully viewed the optic disc and the macula and even the retinal peripheries this way, then you should be confident to be able to report both to your fellow eye professionals and also in your case notes that the patient not only has a good reflex, but also a healthy disc, a healthy macula, healthy retinal vessels and healthy retinal peripheries. These are all really good, relevant positives and should make you confident that you have fully examined the patient to the best of your abilities.